Welcome back to the Weekly Cup Series. I'm Eric Banghart, Manager of Global Sales here at Innovonics. Today we do Optex Part 2 with a deeper dive into the Optex i-Series products with our Innovonics radio on board. Eric Mardian and Richard Ramos will take us specifically through the i-Series photoelectric beams, sharing some best practices for design and installation of this unique product set. Eric is a veteran Weekly Cup presenter from earlier in the year, and received rave reviews for his virtual performance. In this round, he'll be joined by Richard Ramos, a top-notch field application engineer at Optex, who we at Innovonics have partnered successfully with for many years. Eric and Richard might just give you some new creative ideas on how to use their products in this year of COVID to address your customers' evolving needs. Please keep it interactive with lots of lively comments and questions and thanks in advance for responding to our poll questions. Thanks for dropping in today. Eric, Richard, take it away. Welcome everyone. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, Richard and I are pleased to be here today and we want to thank all of you for taking your valuable time to join us uh, for this session. I want to promise you that this is going to be a very, very practical webinar. You will walk away with more information than you knew about before that's practical information that you can use when you deploy, design and install uh, photo beams for your projects. So uh, with that, let's get started. Uh, this is about best practices for the design and installation of photoelectric beams, also known as photo beams or simply beams. All means the same thing. And so with that, I wanted, before we jump in, we have a poll question from Nikki that will allow me to understand who you all are. So Nikki. Thanks Eric. So our poll question today is what's your experience with installing photo beams? So if you could take a moment and just give us your feedback here, we might give Eric and Richard an idea of where you're at. They are coming in. Let's give it just another moment here. Okay, our feedback is slowing down, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling so I can share the results with everybody. And here you go, Eric. Okay, that's great. So most of you have uh, done uh, a few photo beam installs, not too many. Uh, you have, uh, we have some experienced folks. So for you experienced folks, you will pick up on some new things, new tips and tricks. And those of you who have the minimal experience that you've indicated here, uh, will definitely benefit from this session. So thank you for the time uh, in taking that poll. Uh, so with that, I want to jump right in, uh, just touch a, a little bit about something I talked about the last weekly cup, and that is regarding the i-series of um, wireless and battery-powered sensors that Optex offers. Now, we are a sensor manufacturer. That's what we do for a living, and we're very good at it. We've done it for over four decades. And our tagline here with regard to our wireless products is no trenching, no wires, no hassles. The advantages of battery-powered wireless sensors are numerous. Uh, just to highlight a few, the ability to deliver quicker and less expensive installs since there's no trenching or wiring involved. And those of you who have experience installing wireless and hardwired know that that's to be true in many cases, particularly the further uh, range you have or distance you go, uh, wireless just proves itself to be more cost-effective. And also you can install in areas where power is not available, such as rooftops, remote areas, construction sites, just to name a few. And it provides a flexible solutions in changing site environments, particularly with construction sites. You can literally just pick up the sensors and move them as you need to. And it's easy to quickly add additional sensors as needed. It's kind of like the gift that keeps on giving. You can just keep on adding sensors and no worries about back hose or cable cuts because there's no cable to cut. So those are the advantages. Uh, just a word about Optex. I mentioned we've been in business for a while. Uh, we're also a global company. I'm not sure if you, most of you are aware of that, but we are based in 12 countries and serve over 80 countries around the world. If you happen to be tuning in from a region outside the Americas, I uh, list it here on this slide, uh, the websites for the other regions. You can go to those sites and get resources uh, that are relevant to your part of the world as, also, as well as uh, finding your Optex representative. And if you have difficulty with that, uh, or for all of you on the call, if you need to know who your representative is, simply go to our website, if you're in the Americas, at optexamerica.com, 
And you'll look at the top there where it says find a sales rep, click on that. And it'll take you to a page like this where you'll actually see a listing of all our personnel, not just the regional sales managers, but also field applications engineers like uh, Richard. So we uh, encourage you to do that and get that information. Now, diving right in, uh, I wanna talk about the heart of our iSeries wireless offerings. The heart is the EN 1941 transmitter from Innovonics. These are pre-installed in the factory for all of our wireless photo beams and our PIRs. And you can see the um, photograph there on the left, you'll see the transmitter installed into the uh, back box of the uh, wireless photo beam. You see it there next to the wire nuts. A very small little card uh, that has all of the uh, pins and inputs on it there. You see the diagram on the right. So that is the key uh, to the I-Series. And when you take a look at the transmission topology and how that ties in with um, the whole wireless network, it looks something like this. So on the left, you have the uh, wireless uh, enabled devices with the EN1941 transmitter communicating to a repeater. And the model of repeater that we uh, often recommend, you'll see that in our bill of materials if we put a design together for you, is the EN5040T. This is a fantastic repeater, it's powerful. And oftentimes we may recommend more than one repeater, particularly if it's a large site or if you have a lot of concrete and steel, a lot of buildings involved, uh, you generally may need more than one repeater. Uh, and that repeater will then boost the signal over to a receiver. Now, Innovonics has some fantastic receivers that they make available. And the two that I've listed here are the most common ones that we recommend. These are universal receivers, the EN4232 and 4216MR. What I love about the universal receivers is that they can work with any panel out there and any PC application. So what's nice about that is if you're doing a takeover and you have to replace the panel, no problem. These receivers will work with those panels, or if you have to replace a panel down the road, you don't have to rip out all the proprietary transmission equipment from competing solutions because Innovonics will work with any solution out there. So we highly recommend going with those. Although uh, I will mention that Innovonics does make receivers that work directly with Bosch and Honeywell. Oh no. Uh oh panels as well. So please see your Innovonix representative. All right, a little bit about the technology, uh, particularly for those of you that don't have a lot of experience with photo beams or maybe uh, haven't thought much about um, the technology and how it works. It is active infrared. Uh, so what that means is that you have a transmitter side and a receiver side. Uh, remember that photo beams come in pairs. So when we're discussing a solution with you and we talk about needing four sets of beams, it is four sets or eight discrete devices that have to be installed. So you have a transmitter unit and a receive unit, and the transmitter unit is transmitting invisible pulses of infrared light to the receiver unit. And these devices are primarily used in gate and perimeter applications, but you're not relegated to that. These devices can be used in all sorts of applications. And Richard and I can talk to you for better part of a day of all the different applications we've seen and been involved in over the years. Beams are are very flexible in terms of uh, how you can deploy them. And it's very simple technology. When the light beam is interrupted, the alarm is triggered. So it's just a matter of passing, in, passing between the two uh, devices and breaking the beams, if you will, or interrupting the beams simultaneously or within uh, a, a set amount of milliseconds, uh, the system will go into alarm at that point. The detection ranges are terrific for these devices. The wireless devices can go anywhere from 100 feet to 350 feet outdoors from, from beam to beam, or 200 to 700 feet indoors. And these devices are used quite, quite a bit uh, indoors uh, for uh, warehouse applications in particular, uh, are one of the more notable ones. And um, by and large, the transmission range is double for uh, indoor applications. The beams are also harmless to humans and animals. It's invisible pulses of light, uh, they don't cause any harm. All right, so let's take a look at the lineup of our I-Series photo beams. We're very excited about this family here. Uh, you see on the left, the AX series. The AX uh, just denotes a, a certain kind of form factor that you see there, uh, a little short and wide compared to the units on the right, which are part of our SL series. You also notice a number with our photo beam part numbers, wherever you see that, 100, 200, 350, that denotes the detection range in feet outdoors. And again, you can double that number for indoors. 
And the beams on the left, the AX series, those are twin beams. So you have two discrete infrared beams that are transmitted as opposed to the um, SL350Q, that Q means quad, quad beams. So you can see four, four lenses there in the center part of that middle photo. Uh, so you have four beams going across. We recommend quad beams for outdoor applications in particular. Uh, you have uh, less chance of false alarms or reduced alarms because uh, from say animals or um, uh, a tarp blowing in the wind or something like that, uh, you're gonna have to break all four beams. So for outdoor applications where you have more extraneous factors that could create a nuisance alarm or a false alarm, we recommend going that route. The beams on the right, the far right there, the TNRI series, that is a series we introduced a year ago. Those are hybrid beams, where you can actually have one side of the beam pair hardwired and the other side can be wireless. So we've been asked a lot uh, for a solution like this and we finally introduced it last year, very excited about it, doing quite well for us. And that is a, a twin beam or a dual beam as well. All right, just a couple of key features and we will be getting into design and installation best practices. I just wanted to set the stage by pointing out uh, some key features and a little bit about the beams themselves. Um, all of our models come with uh, four selectable channel frequencies. And these are useful when you're uh, stacking beams. You can stack one set of beams on top of another. We'll talk about why, you can, why that's important. Also, uh, being able to deploy long range applications, long perimeters, uh, having the ability to have multiple channels set for each pair is really important. And we're gonna talk about that. Uh, also with our uh, SL350 QFRI model, we have something called environmental disqualification or a DQ circuit. And what's great about this feature is that when you have uh, adverse weather conditions, heavy fog, rain, snow, uh, and they affect the ability for the beams uh, to transmit those pulses of active infrared light uh, for 20 seconds or more, uh, we send a trouble signal to the panel uh, so that you're aware that that set of beams is going to be down until the weather clears up. Very useful feature. Also, our, all of our series uh, of I-series beams include the beam interruption time adjustment. And this is useful, particularly after the install, when you see certain kind of behaviors or things happening in the field that are causing potential false or, or uh, nuisance alarms. Uh, that could be because of, say, a flock of birds regularly going through there, uh, although they'd be hard pressed to break all the beams. But if that happens, you can adjust the beam time and, and set more of a delay in there so that fast moving objects don't continually create a nuisance. Uh, and in particular, for detecting certain types of movement, running, jogging, walking, crawling, uh, having that four different uh, times uh, are useful uh, for adjusting to reduce false alarms and nuisance alarms. Uh, I'm not gonna go through each feature of all the beams. I've already touched on some of the key ones, but you see I've highlighted some here on the uh, SL350 QFRI, which is our flagship uh, and number one selling uh, wireless high series photo beam. Uh, long battery life. The batteries that we use are D-cell lithiums. It comes with uh, a factory installed, it comes with them when you order. Uh, it comes with a pair of batteries for each side of the beam pair. So you see a picture there showing four batteries. There is a compartment to add two additional. When you do that, that boosts the battery life from about uh, four to six years up to eight to 10 years. So these are again, lithium D cells, they last that long, it's pretty amazing. Also, we have an easy to see vivid interior color for optical alignment. So you see that orange part in the center, that means that's the area you're gonna go for the settings of this device. So it makes it easier for installers uh, to quickly set up the uh, beams. And uh, our, these devices are IP65 dust and water uh, protected and UL listed. All right, on the AX series, that's the twin beam that we talked about earlier, you have a five-year battery life, triple tamper functions. So somebody tries to mess with these devices, it's gonna be known. And these are IP55 rated. Generally speaking, we recommend these for indoor applications, but they certainly work quite well outdoors also. And then those hybrid beams I mentioned, the TNRI series, uh, these are great. Again, you could hardwire one side, uh, which is typically the receiving side and the transmitter side would be say out in a parking lot or in a field. The hardwired side would be against a building or near a building where you have power more readily available. It is part of our SL series. So it has that slim body with an anti-frost design with a little hood there on the cover, a little hard to see on that picture there. Uh, and it is also IP65 rated with a five uh, to six year battery life. 
All right, so that's enough of the features of the beams. Uh, let's talk about installing the beams. Once you've selected the type of beam you need for the application, you're gonna to need to think about how am I gonna install these beams? All of our beams have back boxes with knockouts so that you can surface mount them to a building or a post. They also come, they come with pole mount straps so you can pole mount them, uh, which means that you either have poles already in place or you have to um, fabricate or install poles, uh, but they do have to be mounted on something. So one of the best ways to mount these beams, the preferred way and uh, allows for the most flexibility is using our enclosure uh, photo beam enclosures, which we effectively call towers or enclosure towers. And they come in different flavors. We have two heights. We have a six foot, six inch model and a three foot, three inch model. Uh, they come in either a double sided, single sided, and also surface mounted versions. So the ones I'm showing you here are some of the more popular ones. The uh, six foot uh, model is the one we sell the most of, particularly the double sided unit. We say double sided there's an extruded uh, metal uh, rail, and I'm gonna show you an exploded diagram in a moment of what it looks like inside. That uh, metal rail allows you to mount beams on both sides of it. And then it has these polycarbonate lens covers that you can see on, on these photographs uh, that conceal the beams and also protect them. Uh, now, you might be wondering about that three foot, uh, three inch model, uh, where you would deploy that. Typically, we, uh, these are used on rooftop applications to protect the perimeter of a rooftop or uh, RTUs on a rooftop. Also, these can be used in, in environments, um, say a residential uh, complex where maybe aesthetics are an issue, so you wanna go with something shorter. Uh, just to show you again that, uh, a little bit more about these uh, enclosure towers, if you look on the left diagram there, you see an exploded diagram. It shows you all kinds of parts and accessories. Generally speaking, these are all included when we ship out uh, the the uh, tower enclosure to you. There are some accessories though that you have to consider uh, acquiring and we will usually list this, these in our bill of materials when we do a design for you. The first one is an anti-climb tamper you see there in the center and that's to uh, detect anyone trying to climb on top of the beams. We also uh, recommend the base bracket is pretty much uh, required in order to uh, secure the photo beam to a, a concrete block which is something that you would pour the specification is 18 inches by 18 by 18. So it's a nice solid concrete block. The base bracket just sets right into that and then you mount the um, uh, enclosure right onto that base bracket. And it's pretty, pretty solid. I mean, you're gonna be a pretty big truck, you know, blowing through there to knock that thing down. All right, what do these things look like in the field? I wanna show you some examples. These are obviously uh, actual installs. Uh, you see uh, some commercial and residential applications here. Um, one thing you might be thinking is, as you look at these photos is, gosh, that really stands out. You know, somebody really could notice that. Well, part of it is because we are focusing on, on the tower itself, so it does stand out there. But in reality, when you think about the distances that these beams can cover up to 350 feet outdoors, generally speaking, they're not noticed by an intruder. And unless you're from our industry, you might see them and really not know what they are and just try, walk right into the uh, infrared beam path. So um, they are, in truth, nondescript. Uh, the one photo I want to point out too is the second from the left. That's a, um, uh, I believe it's a condominium complex where they've actually extended the fence line by mounting the tower on top of the fence. So that gives you extra uh, height of the fencing there, by like creating a virtual fence. Which, by the way, you see applications like the one on the left where it's uh, right near a fence, and that's a typical application, particularly for a perimeter. Uh, but you can, of course, use these photo beams and this technology in lieu of a hard fence. A fencing is very expensive and, by and large, more expensive than these beams. Here's some more examples. You can see a solar farm there in the center. On the bottom left is an electrical substation. Uh, our beams uh, help to meet the uh, NERC FERC SIP requirements. For those of you who are familiar with those and have worked with uh, electrical uh, companies. Uh, what, the photo in the center there, I believe that's a correctional facility. Uh, on the far right, you see a uh, wall-mounted, surface-mounted uh, enclosure. And then I have a couple of photos there without the enclosure. So you can see what it looks like just mounting the beam directly onto a, a pole, for example. All right, so uh, we get questions a lot about what, what if you're trying to mount the photo beam enclosure in a corner for a perimeter, say a square or rectangular perimeter? Well, that's quite easy. Uh, this is a diagram that uh, Richard uh, kindly put together and it, it shows you how the beam is mounted at a 45 degree angle on a corner. 
And the uh, beams themselves uh, have a, a play of about 90 degrees on each side. The actual lenses, you can move them around. So you can create a nice uh, 90 degree angle of coverage uh, by doing that. And you even have some vertical play uh, about 10 degrees up and down. So very simple solution uh, for creating a nice uh, clean perimeter on a corner using the double-sided uh, enclosure tower. Now uh, we put together an installation punch list for you. So we're moving now more into installation best practices here. This is part of a larger document um, that Richard put together that allows you to uh, successfully install beams. And it's something that we would wanna work with you on ideally, but I, I put together some of the more prominent and important issues on this punch list. The first one being is to watch our installation videos. They are great videos and you can find them at optexamerica.com forward slash videos. We have many product videos in there, but several on installing the photo beams. We highly recommend reviewing these either before or uh, around the time of the install. Our installation manuals, I know a lot of people are not hip on going through the manuals, but they're great manuals and they can be made available to you before you actually receive the beams by downloading them. Uh, on, from our website or uh, accepting the ones that come with the kit. Uh, a key point here uh, in terms of alignment, these beams need to be aligned in terms of the transmit and the receive uh, part of a beam pair. So you wanna make sure you check your voltage uh, at each detector to look for two and a half to three volts. We'll be talking a little bit more about that. Also, you wanna record the installation heights, whether you're going with a single stack or double stack configuration. I was uh, alluding to that earlier about double stacking beams, putting one set on top of the other. Uh, you would do that in situations where the uh, customer is experiencing problems with people crawling into a site. So you get those crawlers by having uh, a set of beams mounted low, but you have a, a higher set in case someone tries to jump in or, or walk in as well. Uh, you can have that set of beams pick them up if the lower set for some reason doesn't. So double stacking is, is actually a very good way to go, to, depending on the type of intrusions your customer is experiencing. So you want to keep a record of, of the heights that you've mounted those in, uh, whether they be on a pole or within our enclosures. Also, you want to ensure that the uh, detection range uh, beam paths are aimed between the shoulder and, and waist of a human body, uh, particularly if you're doing a single stack. You, you're wanting to hit someone in the torso as they walk in between the beam pairs. And you want to adjust the detection area to avoid any obstacles. We'll talk about obstructions and obstacles. It's very important that nothing gets in the way of those beam paths. They have to be clear, clear line of sight to be able to do their job. And you want to plan and implement the correct uh, transmit and receive channel sequencing. So that's kind of a mouthful, uh, but I'm going to turn it over to Richard as I show you this diagram and he'll explain what we mean by that. Go ahead, Richard. Thanks, Eric. So on your left, uh, we have a simple uh, photo beam layout, uh, transmit to receive, um, transmit on one corner uh, to receiver on the other. Uh, you can do, uh, since they are actually aiming at a 90 degree angle, uh, channel differences wouldn't be required. Uh, sometimes if you have them a little less than a 90 degree angle, then you can use the channel differences. We always want you to use uh, offset of uh, two so for example, one uh, transmitter to receiver on channel one, the next set next to it will be on channel three, uh, that to uh, avoid crosstalk. Uh, especially on the channel, or actually on the drawing to the right, when you are double stacking, your top and bottom beams should always be a uh, two set or two channel difference. So again, one and three, and you can also use two and four. Uh, but uh, most likely on, in, in, in these simple cases, uh, you don't need to use the channels if you're single stacking. Uh, and also what you wanna make sure is that you are off a fence line, at least a minimum of three feet uh, for a couple reasons. One is to avoid uh, people jumping over your photo beams and also to avoid uh, we call uh, reflection. Uh, as that beam travels to the receiver, that beam spreads. Uh, at 350 feet, your beam pattern is about five feet wide. So what happens if you are a little too close to high reflective uh, fences or, or something shiny, uh, you will start to receive a reflection issue. Your voltage will bounce up and down, and that's uh, kind of what you want to avoid. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. I appreciate that. Um, so guys, I know that was a lot of information there. This is all covered in our installation videos and in our manuals, but it's a very important facet of the installation. In fact, 
a number of times, uh, well, I should say uh, in a lot of cases, when we get calls regarding customer complaints about nuisance or false alarms, generally speaking, it's because this pattern was not followed properly. Like we'll go in after the fact with the integrator and we'll, we'll see that the sequencing was not done properly. So that's a very important point to keep in mind. Uh, continuing on with the punch list, so you will want to record those uh, frequency channels that are selected in that pattern that Richard just described, whether you're doing a single or double stack. So you'll want to create a, a system there where you notate that. Also, uh, you want to take note of the beam interruption time that you set uh, the beams at, uh, because you may have to make an adjustment later. So if a customer calls and says, hey, I'm getting too many nuisance alarms here, uh, you can see where you had initially set that beam interruption time, and whether you need to go higher or lower on that to uh, help mitigate some of those issues they're having. Also, you want to take note whether the battery saving timer is on or off. Uh, the intermittent output, whether that uh, feature is on or off. I didn't talk about that earlier, but that's a really cool feature that we have that if, if uh, something is blocking the beam paths and, and, and made the beams go into alarm, we want to make sure that that um, has been cleared. So every so often the beams are going to send um, a signal uh, to try to see if that path has been cleared or not. So that would kind of remind, remind you that the, uh, the obstruction has to be moved. Also, you want to, of course, conduct a walk test. We recommend doing that at three points along the beam path. And you want to record the distance the beams are installed from the fence. And this is a really important point that I want to take a moment to talk about. Uh, you may recall I showed you a photo there with the uh, beams really close to a chain link fence. That was a little too close. Uh, we recommend a uh, 39 inch or at least three feet spread from the hard fence to the where the photo beams are installed on the secure side of the uh, owner's property or facility. And for a very simple reason. Uh, if somebody is jumping over the fence, particularly if it's a, a low height fence like uh, four feet or even six feet, you don't want the, excuse me, the intruder to jump over uh, the beams as well. So if you have it right up against the fence, in all likelihood they are going to uh, pass the beams. If they're scaling down the fence, which generally speaking happens a lot where they're just climbing and then just climbing down, our beams should be able to pick them up, but it's not guaranteed. It's better again to have that gap so that when they come down the fence, bam, they run right into the beams. So try to keep that spacing. Sometimes that means customers have to move inventory or, or vehicles or whatever they have uh, away from the fence. If that's a problem, you may consider installing the beams outside of the fence. If the owner of the property owns the area outside the fence, we see that done quite often actually. So you're, you're getting detection before someone actually gets to the fence. That's something to consider. Also, you want to take and uh, retain photos of the installation. That way, if something happens on the customer end, you, know, you have a record of how you install the beams and where you install them. If somebody tried to, <clears throat> excuse me, mess around with them or move them around. And the reason also we ask you to record these things is that when you call our tech support, uh, we will ask you those questions more than likely. We want to know, is the battery saving timer off? Where do you have the interruption time set at? Maybe look at photos. It's all part of us our ability to help diagnose what the situation is and get it corrected for you. All right, I want to focus on a, uh, some cool uh, installation tools here. The first one is the Sniper Viewfinder. Uh, this is something that we developed uh, so that you can properly align the beams. You can see uh, the photo there on the right. Uh, when you look inside the viewfinder, you see a little uh, image there of a, a guy looking into the viewfinder, uh, you see the opposing beam. It really pops out. It's double the magnification, which is fantastic. If you look at the older conventional models that we had, our competitors, most of them I believe still have, uh, you see the opposite beam uh, way out there and it's just a little harder uh, to be able to align that way. So we recommend using that sniper viewfinder. It's built right into the uh, unit. And uh, Richard wanted me to remind you, I have it here in red, you know, use your right eye on the left side of the viewfinder and vice versa. So just a, a little tip there uh, when you're using the viewfinder. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Um, and also um, using a, uh, a voltmeter is probably the most important tool. So once you've done your initial alignment with the viewfinder, simply take your uh, voltmeter, pop it into the uh, monitor jack there, and when you look at uh, the voltage and you see two and a half to three volts, you're good to go. You've got your alignment. Very simple process. And of course, the lenses, as I mentioned earlier, can be adjusted horizontally and vertically. So you have that ability even after you've installed the enclosure uh, you've got some play there to work with. All right, 
So I want to switch it up from installation now and talk about project design as we get close to winding down our presentation. So thank you, uh, all of you, for hanging in there with us. Um, one thing I want to mention about project design and support is that we want to do all the work for you. So we encourage you to use us. I'm going to present to you some information that if you decide to go on your own and do it, that's fine. We want you to have the tools and resources to do it. But we encourage you to get us involved. So if you see a beam project, even if it's one you think may or may not necessitate beams, contact your Optex regional sales manager and, and have a talk about it. Let's see if beams make sense. Uh, let's see if um, it will work out. We'll put together a design, call it a, a, um, a straw model design to see if it makes sense or not. So we'll do that for, for you. We'll provide training, um, on-site visits. We do that quite a bit, site walks to look at the uh, site with you. Even during these times, we're able to do that. Uh, we can provide project registration discounts, but we have to know about the project in order to do that. Also, we can provide professional services, on-site training support for a nominal fee. Uh, Richard, for example, can come out to your site and provide hands-on support and training. And we highly recommend that, particularly for uh, your initial beam job. If this is your first beam project, or you have a new crew that really doesn't have experience with beams, utilize that uh, professional services that we offer. Also, we have a tower and photo beam pre-assembly service that I'm very excited to tell you about. So hang on, I'm gonna tell you all about that in just a moment. So what I wanna show you here is a design that I put together uh, for an integrator. Uh, it, it was for one of their customers, has a very large site, and they wanted to put I-series wireless photo beams around the perimeter of the site. And you can see uh, these black icons that I have along the red colored beam paths. So I have it laid out. We had a brief conversation talking about where the beams need to go, what the customer's trying to protect, uh, what kind of intrusions they're experiencing. So I can help the integrator specify the right beam model and the right placement. So these may not be the exact place that they'll end up going, but it's roughly the right location. And when you're a customer, if you want, you can show them this document, they can better wrap their head around how these beams work and how they will protect their facility. Now, something I don't always do, but in this case, we had two different I-series models, the, as you can see the AL, excuse me, the AX and the SL there on the right. So I created a model location key with the blue letters there. So just to make it easy to locate which models go in which locations. So again, that's something that we do. Um, Rich and I do that every day for our partners, and we're glad to do that for you. In addition to putting together this bill of materials, so we'll put this parts list together for you. All of the parts have hyperlinks built into them, so when you click on this document, it's a PDF document that we furnish you. It will take you to our website, so you'll go to the landing page of that product, and you can get access all the information you need, everything from cut sheets, install manuals, videos, information about accessories for the, those products, it's all there. Uh, in this page here, we provide you the quantities that you need, a little photo of the uh, item, you see some of the accessories listed there, uh, uh, items four, five, and six, as well as the antibiotics parts that we've been talking about, seven through nine. So that is a bill of materials that you would take to your distributor to get your quote. We do sell through distribution. Uh, the, this slide shows you a picture of this is a whole document that we provide you. So we provide slides or pages on all of the products. So you have more detailed description of the product. And again, hyperlinks uh, to take you to more information about those products. Now the free assembly service, I was talking about this earlier briefly. This is something that I highly recommend you take advantage of. And what this entails is that we will install the photo beams into those tower enclosures for you at no charge. So you have a picture there of one of our team uh, there in California installing the beams into the enclosures and then staging them there. You see in the photo on the right. And then we just ship out that whole turnkey uh, enclosure with the beams to your uh, office so that you can take it out to the job site and go ahead and mount it on those bases or wherever you're going to mount it. We actually have, uh, I mentioned, I didn't mention we have a bracket for asphalt. So if you already have a hard surface, you don't need to, to create a base that you pour with concrete. But this is a great service and it's gonna save you a lot of man hours in the field. So we highly recommend taking advantage of this. Uh, all we ask is that you consider there may be a time lag of up to three weeks, sometimes less, sometimes more, it just depends how busy we are. 
And lately we've been very busy. This whole past year, we've been doing a lot of beam projects. Beam, beam sales are really up, especially for our i-series wireless beams. So check with your Optics RSM. Let, let that person shepherd you through the process and, and let you know how we're doing in terms of timing so we can time the delivery right for your customer. And we do ask that you include that site plan like the one I created that I showed you earlier. Uh, that is a requirement in order for us to properly install the beams into the enclosures. Now, if you're wondering uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, should I take advantage of this free service or not? Uh, answer these questions if you can. Can I wait to receive the order after 10 to 14 business days of placing it? Can I provide a project site plan to Optex? Can I have my distributor place the whole project or job on a single PO? We do require that. And can I accept truck freight delivery, maybe needing a lift gate? Because we do have to uh, send these by truck freight because uh, they can get damaged if we send them by any other means. So if you cannot answer, uh, well, I should say, if you answer no to any of these questions, then this service is not for you uh, for that particular project. So what we will do is just go ahead and ship everything out, parts and pieces, and, and just factor in the labor hours to install those beams into the enclosures. And by the way, we cannot in overnight any of our I-Series products, not even our PIRs, because we just can't put those lithium batteries on airplanes. So please bear that in mind. All right, um, one last slide here, and then we're gonna open it up to question and answer. Uh, but if you're going it alone, uh, if you don't want to engage us for whatever reason, uh, and even if you do engage us, we're gonna go through this little list with you. These are design considerations. The first one being obstructions, probably the most important thing. We really cannot have anything getting in the way of those beam paths. So whether it's vegetation, parked vehicles, equipment, stationary objects, um, we need to be able to work around those obstructions. Either the customer needs to remove them uh, before install, or uh, we might need to you know, skirt around them with uh, additional sets of beams, as long as the customer understands um, some of those issues. Uh, secondly, and we talked about this before at length, you know, placing on the secure side of a hard fence, you want, ideally want that 39 inches of spacing. You can go less. Um, I've seen it done less, less as, as short as two feet. Uh, but remember, we don't want anyone jumping over those beams. Is the ground level? Uh, we like level ground with photo beams and minimal undulations, but if you have hillsides and grades involved, particularly with a perimeter, not a problem. You just have to add additional beam pairs. And is the ground stable? Are we talking about sandy soil where over time those um, enclosures or where, however you're mounting them on poles or posts, will they shift? Because that could affect alignment. So bear that in mind. And also is the perimeter of the facility assumed correctly? Um, we can discuss it over the phone and look at Google Earth. But um, as you guys I'm sure know, when you use some of these tools like Google Earth, the photos can be out of date. Uh, sometimes they're woefully out of date. I mean, I've had conversations with guys and I'm looking at something on Google Earth and they're telling me about buildings. I just, I just don't see anywhere. So uh, you guys know the site better than we do. Uh, sometimes photos help, drawings, or uh, it might be a situation where we just need to come out and look at that site with you so we can get a better handle on it. So these are uh, some considerations I ask you to please consider if you're putting together a job on your own. But again, utilize us because why spend the labor and the resources and tie up your estimators um, you guys want to go out there and, and sell and install. Let us do this design work for you. That's what we do for a living. Um, so with that, um, I am through. I hope that was a great experience uh, and good information for you. I have our information up here, our tech support and uh, uh, means of contacting Richard and me. Uh, we thank you very much for your time and I turn it over to Nikki. All right, great. Thanks so much, Eric. We did get a lot of good questions, so I'm going to just jump right in and start reading them off. And between you and Richard, I'm sure we can get these all answered. So let's see. First question. All right. Um, when you have interface issues, what have you found to be the common sources? So interface issues could be uh, interfacing with uh, third-party equipment. Uh, well, with the Nivonics, it's seamless. With, uh, and I would say seamless with um, burglar alarm panel equipment as well, if you're using the universal receivers. So those interfaces, we typically don't have issues with them. 
uh, but we always recommend consulting with your Innovonics and Optex representatives uh, to let us know what types of devices you, you're wanting to use. Uh, Richard, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. You're correct there. Um, I, for some reason, when I saw the question coming, I thought it was interference issues. So just to make sure that we have the right uh, question. But yes, you're correct. Oh, you're right. I'm so sorry. When you have interference issues, you're right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry about that. That's my bad. Excellent. Uh, well, sure. I mean, I, I'm sure we've had some. Um, I want. I don't want to say Optics has had that issue. Um, in Avonics, is that something that you could check uh, with your wireless survey kit? Have you seen any of that, Eric? Yeah. You know, generally, interference is not a, a big uh, a consideration with <clears throat> our wireless. Uh, you know, we're sending messages out on multiple channels, randomized. Uh, we can usually get a, get around any kind, kind of interference, especially on the installation. You might take a look at that with the survey kit, um, you know, making sure you've got the appropriate amount of repeaters and you know, whatever distances. You need. And it just, it's all about a good design up front, as you guys alluded to earlier. And uh, certainly our territory managers uh, coupled with the uh, the Optex team, um, we'll get you on the right track up front if, if you utilize those resources. Okay, great. Um, next question, is there a bundle for the beams and towers or is everything ordered as a separate line item? So generally speaking, everything's ordered as a separate line item, as you recall from that parts list I showed you. But if you take advantage of our uh, uh, photo beam assembly service that I talked at length about, you know, we will include everything turnkey, everything installed in that photo beam, accessories, beams, the whole kit and caboodle will be shipped out to you. Okay, great. And then uh, do you still offer an SL650? Yes, that is our, uh, our hardwired uh, offering. So we have a hardwired uh, equivalence of all our photo beams that we talked about today. But you can't beat wireless. No wires. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Do the SL350 QFRI require battery power or can they be wired to a power supply? They cannot be adapted uh, to be hardwired. We get that question a lot, uh, but they do come with the batteries. Those uh, lithium ion batteries I mentioned, uh, those are by a company called SAFT, S-A-F-T. We highly recommend them. Some people will try to use other third-party batteries. These batteries have been um, optimized, specified for our photo beams, and they, they work great. Again, anywhere from four to 10 years, depending on how many batteries you put in. Okay, great. And kind of on that wavelength, are these lithium batteries user replaceable? Yes, most definitely. And again, I recommend sticking with the SAF batteries. Those are available uh, through Optex and through your distributor. Okay, and then how do the batteries handle the Canadian winters? <laughs> okay, I'll turn that one over to Richard. You might have some experience sure. with that. So our uh, battery or our, our photo beams um, and, and even wireless uh, motions with the Innovonics uh, already down to about negative four, which is uh, what, 20 degrees Celsius. Um, the batteries will last you probably about negative 10 Fahrenheit, the max, uh, which will then it will just kind of just go to sleep. So when it warms back up, it will work again for you. So we try to, uh, you know, minimize installing uh, what we are up front. You know, if you do um, mount them up in Edmonton, Calgary, and in, in those areas, uh, they're going to work for a certain amount of time and uh, kind of go to sleep after that. Okay, great. Um, and then could either of you explain the sniper viewfinder? Oh, sure. Um, I talked about that uh, on a slide. Uh, some of you may have uh, maybe missed that part, but um, the viewfinder is built into our beams. So if you remember, the, I showed a couple photos where you see that orange colored area in the center. The viewfinder is built into the side of the unit. So when you look into it, it's a telescoping viewfinder you'll be able to see the opposing beam. So you obviously will be mounting the beams um, with a general line of sight, just general visual line of sight that you measure out. And then you wanna adjust the lenses to be able to see each other. And that's what the viewfinder does. It actually magnifies this double magnification of the opposing beam. 
so that you, when you see it centered in your viewfinder, then you know that you're gonna probably have no alignment issues, but definitely use the voltmeter after that. Okay, great. And then this one's a little bit more of a comment than a question, but Miko says that she loves the Optex beams. Installed correctly, they are excellent. So just a little feedback, I suppose. We appreciate that. And we get compliments all the time on our beams. You know, I can say almost unequivocally uh, that our beams are definitely the best in the world. Um, I rarely encounter situations where, you know, my partner and me, the integrator and me, lost a deal to a competing beam company. And there aren't too many out there. I mean, we're, we really set the standard. I think we scare a lot of people away. <laughs> <laughs> Competitors. All right. Next question. Thank, thank you for that. <laughs> Is there a concrete pad template or base available or how to create a form details for the concrete base construction? I mentioned the dimensions, but uh, which are 18 inches by 18 by 18. But Richard, do you have any further comment about that? Yes, yeah, so we do have a template for the AXTWEB, which is a concrete base bracket. Again, dimensions, uh, the side, the, the length, the width, and the depth. Uh, and we can always ship those out ahead of time. So if you are pouring concrete, uh, get those out ahead of time before, let that sit and dry while we preassemble. And then all you're doing is just getting the towers and uh, bolting them down and programming your each beam to the Innovonics. Great. Um, and this again is just some feedback or um, ideas to share is most of these draw so little that I have done some of um, some with solar panel setups. That's kind of neat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let me see. I do not do alarms, but I do cameras. Can I still install Optex and make it ready for the alarm guy or use it with a camera system if possible? Most of the customers are interested in seeing what and who caused the alarm. Yes, uh, Richard, you want to take that one? Oh, absolutely. Um, we are the sensor, uh, basically uh, the trigger, uh, talking wirelessly to the Innovonix receiver, which has relay output. So if you want to trigger a camera, light, siren, strobe, that's all up to you. Um, so for visual verification, yes, you can see what triggered that uh, event. Okay. And then on construction sites or other applications, have you found the need for protective bol is it bollards? 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 Or cement poles to physically protect the beam set? In some environments, yes, particularly if it's a um, facility that has a lot of uh, employee uh, vehicles or heavy equipment that's being moved around. Uh, even in warehouses, uh, we see that where um, forklifts and whatnot could potentially hit those beam towers or wherever the beams are mounted. So bollards are definitely a good idea. Obviously they have to be placed so they're not obstructing the beam paths, but in such a way that um, it would be very difficult to harm the uh, enclosures or the beams themselves. Great. Um, next question. Can I just use the alignment lights on the unit instead of a meter? Good question. Okay. Um, you can to a certain point. However, um, it's just going to give you a means. Um, and depending on also the, the beams you are using, uh, the AX models, uh, your top and bottom heads are three inches apart. So when you're doing your alignment process, both heads move left and right or up and down. With the SL350s, um, they're a lot taller and you have to align them individually. So with a voltmeter uh, on their SL series, you want to make sure that you are properly aligned with top and bottom head. You could have your top heads off a little bit and the bottoms uh, you know, aligned properly. Uh, but if you stick a meter on it, the meter is gonna show you something different. It could show you, uh, you know, a, a voltage of two and a half volts, but it's bouncing. So that's gonna tell you a couple things. It could be reflection, but it also could tell you not properly aligned. Okay. If, if you're relying on the indicator lights and you don't have a voltmeter handy, obviously perform a walk test at three different points and that'll Absolutely. tell you if you're aligned as well. So. Okay, great. Um, what about accumulating snow impact on the lower set of a stacked beam set? Good question. Uh, Richard, you might have experience with some of those working up. So I, 
Yeah, sure. I, so I live in Utah and uh, we do get two to three feet of snow here um, where I live. And um, that is a good question as in, okay, your beam height is going to be uh, key. Uh, you don't want to mount them too low. Uh, also know that again, that the AX models, which are again, three inches apart, if I mount that at, you know, two feet off the ground, it's a potential for me to block those beams when that snow accumulates. The uh, SLs are a foot apart, so I may just break uh, the bottom beam, which will not give me an alarm output, but kind of rendering, uh, you know, uh, it's going to trip the, on the second beam if anything passes it. So again, maintaining the, the property uh, is, is the best thing to do and or mounting it at a proper height to avoid those uh, blocking uh, from snow. And that's where double stacking can really help when you have that higher set of beams and you got this, the snow piled up, so the person's gonna walk higher up the beam tower, if you will, or wherever the beams are installed, so that higher set will catch them. Okay, great. Um, uh, I think I saw a heater option. When is it recommended? Yeah, the heater option, uh, unfortunately, is not available with our I-Series wireless beams. That's available for our hardwired beams. Okay, gotcha. And then we've got a few more here in the Q&A. Um, we already answered this um, to if beams work in colder environments. Uh, let's see. Are there other Innovonics products that are commonly installed with beams? Well, if we're talking about our I-Series, which uses the Innovonics uh, EN 1941 transmitter I talked about, we have um, uh, over a dozen uh, PIR or passive infrared motion sensors that are part of the I-Series family. And in a lot of applications, our photo beams are used in conjunction with those devices. So we do have a wide suite of I-Series products we're very excited about. Talk to your Optex representative to get more information on those. In terms of using other Innovonics products, um, certainly there are more than the ones I've shown you. And between your Optex rep and your Innovonics rep, we can help you on that. Okay, great. Um, next question. Do you have MTTF for your equipment? Richard, do we? <laughs> Mean time before failure. Is that what you're asking? Uh, on some of our products, yes. Uh, that's something that we would have to uh, locate for you if we're okay. looking for a specific product. Okay. Reach out to us individually and we can, we can dig that out for you. Yeah, and I can, I can send you um, contact information for a better follow-up mm -hmm. for that, too. Um, Robert Eastman asks, what is the software interface for intrusion detection, establishing protection schedules, et cetera? Well, okay, with, with regard to software, uh, that would be governed by your uh, panel equipment. So there's really no software involved or any software interfacing with our photo beams because we are end devices. Uh, we don't control anything. We simply detect and send a signal back through the Innovonics equipment back to uh, a panel. So whether you're using a Honeywell or DMP or some a brand of panel, uh, you would be using their software to govern that. Okay, great. Well, that is all of our questions, guys. I don't see any more coming in. Um, if Great. we do have a few uh, last ones come in, we, we do follow up with you via email, so not to worry. And then lastly, before I pass this back over to Eric, um, in the chat box, I actually shared next week's Innovonics Weekly Cup. Um, the topic is integrating Innovonics wireless and integrated control technology. So integrating um, Innovonics with ICT. So if you'd like to join us, you can go ahead and just click that link to register. And with that, I will pass it over to Eric for some closing words and our winners this week. Okay, great. Much thanks to Eric and Richard. As always, great information and insight into utilizing these great products. And thanks again for being great partners with Innovonics. So here are the coffee card winners for signing up or joining today's presentation. Glenn Taylor with Versic, Chris Hill with Gill Security, and Faye Payne with JCI. Congrats to all. So please reach out to Eric, Richard, or any of our territory managers for help on your next beam project. Uh, please take care and we'll catch up with you again next week on the Weekly Cup. Cheers. So long, thank you. Thank you.